Next up, David Charles Allen, a Village Properties realtor and host of The Hop, that's Home Ownership Podcast, It's a Beautiful Life. Hi, David. Hey, Patty. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. So mortgage rates this week are actually switched for the first time in quite some time. Um, the 3% for 30 year for conforming and actually jumbo is lower than conforming. So that's the switch up right there. So it's 2.875 for non-conforming jumbo. Again, this is all dependent on average credit and credit history. So just be sure to talk to your realtor or your, or your mortgage lender to get the bottom of what interest rates going to be the best for you. Thank you, David. That's really important to know. Appreciate that. And how can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more about what's available, interest rates, or anything else real estate oriented? You can get a hold of me at 805 617 9301 or emails david at davidcharlesallen.com. Thanks, David. Yeah. And then we'll lead right in and end off with how the Statistics have been performing this last week. So we've had 11 coming soon listings, 38 new listings, three price changes, 42 pendings, and 33 have closed. So we're still seeing a really big demand. Uh, like you said, 38 new listings and uh, 42 that were pending. So our supply is not building up and we're reaching uh, again at an all time low of uh, available houses out there. So there's still a lot of competition, uh, a lot of people looking to purchase, and you just got to do your best and know that your time is going to be right whenever you're able to ride home. You are the eternal optimist. I love that about you, David. <laughs> All you can do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'm very excited because I know we have a special guest today. Yeah, we have a great special guest. I'm very excited to talk to her, Laurel Grench. She's actually runner of Dreamcatcher Hill which is a dog rescue and animal rescue and also breeder and amazing person. And we look forward to talking with you more. Laura, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Yeah, so, thank you so much for being our guest. So tell us a little bit more about how you got involved with what you're doing now. I know you were a nurse in your prior experience. How did you come accustomed to what you're doing now? Um, actually, from grade school, I raised various pets. I've always been drawn to pets and, and babies, lots of babies. <laughs> so I was a paramedic and then a nurse. So, yeah, I even worked labor and delivery in the hospital for a while. So, wow. so you just shifted just from two-legged uh, mamas to, to the four-legged ones. That makes sense to me. Yep. <laughs> so it's kind of gone both back, back and forth. I kind of do all of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I like everything. Yeah. What a wealth of experience you have. So how did you end up in, have you lived in Illinois your entire life? I did. I was actually born in the Chicago suburbs and only lived in Missouri for a couple of years and then back into Illinois where we needed to be a little closer to family that was still up in the suburban area. Okay. So I've lived in this area for a long time. How many acres do you have on your farm? We've got 20 acres and then we helped my son buy five acres. That's right next door, which really was kind of for selfish reasons. He can come and help me now on the farm at, at my beck and call. doesn't oh, really work that way, but I had hoped. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Ideal. Mm-hmm. And are your grandkids right next door too? They're six miles away. So pretty close. It's country miles. So it goes pretty quick when you're out here. There's right. one stop sign. Oh. oh, that's beautiful. So tell us a little bit more about your farm you have. Is it basically mainly animals or do you do a lot of gardening and produce as well? No, it's just animals. We've got four separate horse pastures that are um, some of my rescue horses are my daughter's retired horses that live here. And we've got miniature goats and or miniature donkeys. We've got milk goats, Nubians, um, a lot of baby goats right now. We've got nine baby goats on bottles. Um, besides dogs, lots of rescued cats, got chickens and peacocks, ducks. Um, two of our very first ducks was a couple months after Easter, they wandered into a relative's garage in town. 
Oh, we no. don't know where they came from, but they brought oh, them out to goodness. us. Do you want some ducks? It's like, okay. <laughs> so we added ducks. <laughs> wow. So I'm That's... interested. Did you have a suburban life before you were on a farm, so to say? I did, but I never fit in suburbia. My uncle still <laughs> has a newspaper clipping. But my, my goat that I had purchased had gotten out while I was in high school. And so the police ended up at our house because I wasn't supposed to have a goat. So oh, <laughs> I, oh. I was never meant to live in suburbia. <laughs> that is so fascinating that you were not meant to do that. And even as a child, it wasn't working out for you. <laughs> No, no, it didn't work out. <laughs> so. Well, I feel like uh, yeah. with this COVID happening and everyone kind of being secluded in their own houses, a lot of people are looking towards that kind of lifestyle. Is there any recommendations or what you have to be willing to do to kind of live that uh, farm lifestyle with all these great animals around you? It's a lot of work. I mean, there certainly are some surrounded by things that are just cute all the time and it's really enjoyable but the physical work is always there if you have any variety of animals or pets and if you live in rural you can't just go to town quickly town mm-hmm. is 12 miles away so there's it's a little bit different lifestyle yeah, you know, and with all the babies the that depend upon you, you really have to be up at all hours, I'm sure, making sure they get fed and taking care of them. It's definitely, if you have anything with babies, like our puppies, uh, it's not uncommon for me to get up every two hours around the clock if I have a puppy or a couple puppies that are particularly small. Right now, I'm actually bottle feeding baby bunnies, um, oh, but fortunately, gosh. bunny rabbits... They're they're easier because bunnies only feed their babies two or three times a day. So as long as I can get them full in a feeding, I'm good for a much longer period of time. But the puppies are pretty much every two hours until they're big enough to go a little longer. But yeah, it's it's a lot of work, not much sleep. You no, should do a reality no. show on your uh, your life, Laurel. It just <laughs> sounds so, so fun and interesting and all the various animals. I have so many questions for you. I wonder, first of all, these cats, because um, my grandparents lived on a farm. It was about a 40-acre farm in Nebraska. So I know they had a lot of cats around, but they were really quite wild. I mean, they would put out food for them. Um, are the cats around you? Did you say you have? How many? I mean, are they a little bit tame or are they, are they feral cats? How, how would you describe them? Most of them actually are extremely friendly. Oh. Uh, we keep food in four different places. We have water out. Even when it's freezing, we have to change the water real often to keep it from freezing. We've got relatives with allergies, so we can't have the cats in the house at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have a area in the barn, so if we have cats that have just had... Um, We'll keep them in overnight if they've been spayed or neutered, but Mm -hmm. then we have a a secluded, nice area in the barn for them to recover after surgery. Everything is spayed and neutered, Um, and a lot of our cats actually came from people who just call me with a real sob story, Mm -hmm. and we end up with their cats, and I'm not even a real big cat fan Mm -hmm. (laughs) I really like dogs right I feel (laughs) the same way even though I I I still can (laughs) admire their beauty and their freedom and their independence but I'm just very drawn to dogs but that's nice to know Mm -hmm. that they're kind of tame they're used to people oh yeah they follow me around and I usually give them goat milk when I'm milking so they're they're quite demanding (laughs) oh (laughs) need to have their Mm -hmm. their fresh goat milk (laughs) oh I know you run, uh, you actually sell some of the dogs and you adopt them out as well. And from reading your bio, it's really great that you really try and match the people with the dog's personality. Is that just come from experience or have you come to really know the dogs and themselves and know the people as well? Um, Generally, it's what people tell you. So sometimes it's not completely accurate. Uh, a lot of it is because we have different breeds of dogs and generally all have different personalities, but matching somebody with 
both the personality of the puppy, the individual puppy, and the breed is really helpful because some people only see a picture and they have no idea of what the reality is of, say, living with a terrier. Terriers are very strong-willed, so it's really important that somebody who gets a terrier is also strong-willed because you really want to match a person's personality with the personality of, of the dog. Active people get active dogs. Mellow people should have a real mellow dog. So it's it's hard for people because they see a picture and they think all dogs are the same. It's just you're getting something by looks, and it's, that's not very accurate. That's so interesting. I actually have a Jack Russell Terrier, but of course I'm not <laughs> stubborn at all. <laughs> he might be a little. <laughs> <laughs> just a wee bit and active too, I bet. <laughs> yes, yes. But he is definitely ended up being, you know, one of the big loves of my life, that's for sure. And he's, but he, I don't know. This is interesting to me. I don't know if he was abused or if it's just part of his temperament. He is a scared dog. He acts all tough when he's inside barking at people that walk by. But in reality, he gets really scared. And I got him quite young, but I don't know if he had a bad experience or if it's just his temperament. Would you have it an idea? It can be a variety of, or it can be actually lack of experience. Sometimes puppies are just naturally a little bit shy. Mm -hmm. And the more you socialize them with different places, different people, different animals, the more outgoing they become and they become more confident. So yeah. when you have a dog that's home a lot and doesn't mm -hmm. get to do a lot of new experiences when they're very young, yeah. some of them can react fearfully and it can take a lot to get them to realize they don't need to act that way. Right. So we went to a hotel. This is the second time this has happened last weekend. And of course, he was scared to death. But he's a couple of years old now, but he still, I don't think I did get him out enough. But he got so scared just being in a new environment that he got out of his harness. But he was very smart, smarter than me. He knew his way back to the room, even though it was a big sprawling place. So that was good. Wow. I kind of followed behind him. I knew he wasn't running mm -hmm. away per se. He just gets scared. He mm -hmm. just kind of freaks out sometimes. It's And sometimes people don't realize it, but when you have a scared dog, they want to coddle them and say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. And actually that can make them more fearful. If you oh. act very confident, mm -hmm. they will take your lead. It takes some practice. But mm -hmm. if you see them acting fearful, don't look at them, but just it's kind of like, come on, let's go. This is great. We're going to have yeah. fun. Well, and the dog will advice. actually help follow your lead because mm -hmm. they really want to have a – somebody else leading right. and so whatever however you react they respond yeah I think I yeah. need to follow you around on your farm for a few days <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I think you really hit the nail on the head there I have a small dog that's a five and a half pounds a little chihuahua mix and uh -huh. a lot of the times she would be scared of the bigger dogs when she she was a rescue too so she was really scared of everything mm -hmm. when I first got her but even going, taking her to the beach and seeing bigger dogs, she'd get really scared. And, mm -hmm. you know, you want to pick her up, but at the same time, you want to be like, hey, it's okay. Let's go. Come on. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. and did that help? Bigger personality, just like you were saying, just from that. Mm -hmm. did, did it work for her? It did. It, it's still, yeah. It's okay. still for her. Yeah. Oh, yeah. terrific. Terrific. Yeah. It, it does. It's, it's kind of, it seems. So abnormal, though, it's exactly the opposite of what we seem to want to instinctively do is like to pick them up and say, oh, it's OK. Right. <laughs> and yeah, unfortunately, with dogs and training problems in general, that happens a lot. What you would think would be the best response actually makes the problem worse. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense, Laurel. Now, I've got an elderly dog in the background who's actually whining a little bit. But, you know, I would like to blame it on you since you have like 100 animals all around you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually know when I read about you on your website at one point you had, and I'm sure you've had it several times, an elderly dog um, in your midst. I mean, my dog is like 20 years old and he's you know, gone blind in one eye and the other, I don't know how much he sees out of it. And he does get confused. And yet he really misses me when I'm gone and kind of howls and cries. It's interesting because I wouldn't even think he would know when I'm there, but he knows more than I think. 
Oh, their sense of smell and their just sense of being is really amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and probably because he is older, he actually has lost confidence and he feels the need to, you know, have somebody close that's familiar. Dogs can get dementia just like people too, and they can get like lost and stuck in literally a corner of a room. Oh, he does. And because do that. they can feel mm-hmm. a wall. Yeah, yes. and it's it's dementia just like people, yeah. so it's it's really hard watching right. our, our it is because he'll be at the window, you know, thinking it's the door, and so it does it does happen a bit, and he always seems to follow any person, be right there underfoot. So he must have mm-hmm. a little insecurity, like you're saying. You're just so wise and wonderful. This is amazing to get all this great information. Well, I don't know about that, but no, <laughs> I've been it doing is. It a long time experience. Yeah. Don't sell yourself short. So I also <laughs> wanted to ask you, have you seen a lot of people looking to adopt recently? Because I know our local humane society and rescue centers have kind of been um, lacking any dogs because people are trying to take them home and spend quality time with them during this situation. Have you kind of seen similar things happen in your area? I have. In fact, we even had a seven year, well, we'd had a rescue dog for seven years that I just could not find an appropriate home for him. And about two months after COVID started, we actually had a couple adopt him. And he was, he was a very large black male dog, which unfortunately they're some of the hardest to adopt. I'm I'm not really sure why, because black Labradors are such popular dogs, but he was a lab mix and, but he didn't like cats. And he was kind of unpredictable if he was loose with children. Not that he had ever been aggressive, but I just didn't quite trust him. So I wanted to know children, no cats, no other dogs home. And they absolutely love him, love him. It was a perfect match. He goes for walks all over the place. And when he's on the leash, he's perfectly behaved. So they're just thrilled to have him. And we were great that he, he waited such a long time to get a home and I think so many people being home, they actually have the time to spend with training um, that they don't normally have when they're working and gone for long hours. Well, I'm so happy for him that he finally got his forever home. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. What do you do with dogs that are aggressive, uh, whether it's over food or a toy or anything? Do you ever have that problem come up on your farm? Um. With our own dogs that I have raised, we don't because I'm the boss. And as long as dogs have a person that's the boss, they actually are really good. But we have had quite a few dogs that we've gotten into rescue that could be a little bit bossy about thinking that they should be the boss. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I don't know if you've ever watched Caesar Milan. I yes. Think he's just the most brilliant person ever I when like it comes to, to watch him. dogs. Mm-hmm. Yep, and so I have advised people that come with problems um, to to watch what he does and to understand its psychology. Currently, people are being told to give their dogs a lot of treats for good behavior, and what I'm seeing is it's actually causing more and more problems because you have to be super good at giving the treat at the exact right moment, and the dog can't be doing anything bad because mm-hmm. if the dog's doing something bad it's like it's, it sat down but it's growling at you and you give it oh. a treat but you just rewarded it growling at you right and people don't realize there's a, a technique with it so I actually don't like anybody giving dogs treats unless you're more advanced in training because it's so sense. easy to give them at the wrong time yeah. um, and there's, just, there's a lot of little little things yeah. Um, Caesar really explains it best. Things like you go out the door before your dog. When you feed your dog, you make him wait for his food. You can even stand between him and his food bowl, especially if they're food aggressive. You just don't let him have the food because it's your food. Mm-hmm. And when he's sitting and looking at you and being calm, then you can say, okay, I'll, I'll share my food with you. You can eat it now. It's super easy. It's really passive, non-aggressive. But in the dog's mind you were the boss and you told him when he could eat. And so he's not as likely to bite the boss as he is going to bite somebody that 
it's his food and he's keeping you away from it. Right. Well, I was wondering very subtly. Yeah, how you felt about Caesar Milan and that method of just thought about dogs, because they're, of course, our dogs, trainers and dog people who are not fans of Caesar Milan, but I really like him too. And I love to see uh, him walking down the street with this whole pack of dogs. It's just amazing. Or people where he's gone to their house and they've had what seem to be severe problems and how quickly he turns things around. It's just amazing. It is. It's, it's really fascinating. I had German shepherds before I'd ever seen Caesar Milan and I really wish I had been able to watch how he was training dogs before I had my shepherds because Mm -hmm. I never could get them to stop barking at people. Um, They weren't aggressive, but they would bark and they wouldn't be quiet when I wanted them to. Mm -hmm. And now when I see that, I know what to do. And it's basically you just put yourself between whatever they're barking at and you stare your dog down because you're saying, hey, you're out of line and this person is supposed to be here, but you're acting badly. And uh, by giving, by staring at your dog until they calm down or even leave, they realize oh, you've got this. Okay, fine. You can have it. I won't bark at them anymore because you're in charge. Well, Laurel, I've got to try that because Ollie, that's the one who gets scared. He barks all the time from the inside when he knows he really doesn't have to (laughs) confront anybody. And then my daughter's pug lives with us too, and he barks at everybody outside. So I've tried squirting him with a squirt gun. You know, I've tried giving him treats, but I've probably done it wrong when he's not barking. So I'll have to try some of this. (laughs) I've got issues. Nobody's going to hire me as a dog trainer. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard to be persistent, though. Once you start it, you have to do it every single time. Right. And it is really shocking how quick, when you do it every time, they actually, it's like something switches in their brain and they realize something's changed. But when a dog has done it for a long time with a habit, it can take a little longer for that switch to happen. So you have to be really persistent and patient waiting for them to understand that you're in charge. Wow. So they're great. I, I can't imagine not having a variety of dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so how many animals do you have in total, do you think, or do you not have a running count? <laughs> I really don't have a running count. I did just count out that I do have eight full-size horses, one miniature horse. We've got four donkeys. And the goats, we've got five adult goats and nine babies. The others change a lot. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Especially the the cat situation where we ended up with quite a few extra cats because somebody was being evicted and she had seven cats and begged me to take them. So we ended up getting them. And um, and then with our puppies, you know, we adopt out the puppies regularly. So that number changes depending mm-hmm. on just how many are here and how many have been old enough to go to new homes. And then you start. So we don't have any rescue dogs oh. right now. They, they did all get homes. Oh, that's so wonderful. I love that. So you started as a West Highland Terrier breeder before you expanded to all these other creatures. Is that mm-hmm. correct? Yeah, mm. that is. I had, we had, I had originally full-size collies for a while and German shepherds and then when I got my first Westies um, we were actually babysitting them and I just fell in love with them they just have so much personality and yet they're small and they don't shed very much so I've had Westies for over 30 years now are Westies hypoallergenic they are a lot of the terriers are actually hypoallergenic okay which makes them easier for some people Um, if you have allergy problems in the family. So you are a dog breeder in a sense, but a lot of dog breeders out there get bad reps. Is there a reason for that in terms of um, how you can differentiate yourself, so to say? Um, A lot of dog breeders are just in it for the money. And so their parent dogs, they really, they don't house them very well. They don't get the vet care they need. And they're just kept more like somebody would breed. I mean, it's really sad, but the commercial industry of like chickens and cattle and dogs are just so intelligent. Um, We do like a lot of health testing. Every dog breed has potential problems that are more common in that particular breed. Like you've probably heard of hip dysplasia and German shepherds. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's just certain things, but you can do testing for a lot of these things. And so we do a lot of testing. Our vets, we actually have home numbers for our veterinarians. So if we have an emergency, um, we'll take our dogs in at any time. So, but, and a lot of breeders just don't do that, but they're, they're our furry best friends. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my youngest daughter just got her, fir- she's an adult, but she just got her first puppy, um, a golden retriever. And my goodness, she's having so much fun, but it's like a big responsibility. It's like a test for motherhood. <laughs> I think, you know, I think it's very good. She yep. got married, married last year, but she did get the dog, um, from a pet store. And had she asked me, I would have probably told her to go to a breeder because you hear so many stories about dogs at pet stores, but maybe some of them are okay. What do you think, Laurel? It really depends on the pet store and where they truly get them from. Unfortunately, with the pet stores, you often have no way to know anything about the dog's background if the parents have been tested for any of the common health problems in that breed and you don't know how the puppy was raised or how the parents are kept. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest problem with pet stores and pet stores a lot of times don't even know where they get their dogs because they get them from a broker. So that's where the puppy mill problem comes from is nobody knows exactly where the dogs start until somebody's seen a place in person. Yes. And it's, no problematic. Yeah, I saw a terrible post on Facebook. I, I mean, I just had to leave the post almost as soon as I saw it, but it had these puppies just in, in a cage, just one on top of the other, on top of the other. You know, I think somehow it may have been associated with China, but it was just heartbreaking to see these beautiful animals put in such a space where they wouldn't have room to go to the bathroom or anything. It was just horrible. Yeah, you you may have actually seen the China dog meat market, mm. which is the most horrific thing ever. Um, Maybe. They, they pack them in there into, basically, it's a wire box full yes. of dogs. It's, mm-hmm. just, it's just terrible. Yeah. Yeah, so, horrifying. Um, you, there's, there's a lot of really terrible things out there, unfortunately. So, and that's one of the reasons I avoid telling people to ever get a puppy from a pet store is Mm -hmm. because it helps people be accountable when somebody can literally come to your home and see the dogs where they're living. To me, that's important. If you're going to um, basically spend your money and promote this, you want to do it in a way that you're not actually promoting somebody who has their dogs that, you know, they're out in all weather conditions and they don't have shelter or appropriate, appropriate veterinary care. Yeah, and my daughter who adopted this pug, supposedly from a welfare organization, she drove down to San Diego, they advertised, and it was obviously a terrible situation. Her little puppy, first we thought he was uh, a dwarf because he was so tiny, his little ribs were sticking out, they were like two days late in delivering them to her, but when she saw him, she knew she had to take him and try to save his life, and now he's a healthy little guy. He could tell any food, he would just be starved for and now he actually turns his nose up at dry food so it's a nice turn of events and he's a darling little puppy yeah. but even some of these so-called rescue organizations are not really what they claim to be no they're not it's it's really sad there are people who make a lot of money where they get dogs and they don't take care of them appropriately because they're not interested in the dogs they're only interested in who's going to actually pay an adoption fee Mm-hmm. And, and things like that. I mean, that we actually also helped with um, a lot of dogs that are on transport where there's a lot of shelters in different areas, particularly the South. And I don't know what the difference is, but in the South, there's a lot of shelters that have very short hold times. So a stray dog could be picked up. And if nobody claims it within four to 10 days, it's euthanized. Oh. And there's a lot of rescue organizations that um, have uh, the 501c3 nonprofit Mm -hmm. status. And so they have a way to get those dogs and see those dogs. Some of them aren't even open to the public. You don't even Mm -hmm. know the dogs are there. Right. And they can then rehome them. So we also helped with both transport or overnighting dogs because there seems to be less dogs in the north than there are in the south. So 
for quite a while before COVID anyway, there were a lot of uh, humane societies or rescue organizations that actually had people wanting dogs and they didn't have any dogs. So they would work to get the dogs transported from where they're going to be euthanized in the South to their organization where they can get them into homes. And we've had several dogs where they're coming all the way from Texas and they're going to Michigan um, and St. Louis is kind of a hub and we're fairly close. So we've overnighted them. They've had weather problems where we've had dogs for a week or two and we just keep them here. But it's like one time we had a mom with all these puppies and I was like, you don't get a whole lot of information. And I'm like, oh, okay, this, this puppy's almost dead. And those aren't all her puppies. I don't know where the puppies came from, but they don't mm-hmm. match at all. Right. And uh, we ended up oh. taking the puppies to the veterinarian ourselves because, you know, they arrived in such bad shape, but they, that's because they had just come out of a shelter and they just weren't taken care of. Wow. So okay. there's a lot of people that do volunteer. There's little pilots that have their own planes that literally will fly dogs from one city to another just volunteering oh my gosh. wonderful wow that's beautiful well there's going to be a special spot for you in heaven and all the dogs you have taken care of that are on the other side i'm sure over the rainbow bridge will be there to greet you um it's just amazing work that you're doing you're not an official nonprofit, are you laurel even though you do all this good work and obviously spend your own money to care for a lot of yeah. animals in bad shape uh, we're, we're not. I do work with a couple uh, rescues that are nonprofit, mm-hmm. but it's a paperwork issue. And right. technically, I have to be careful. I can rehome a dog, but I can't really do true rescue in Illinois until we're actually building a kennel. Because in Illinois, if you rescue a dog and you adopt it out with a contract, um, they have a lot of very strict requirements. Like the dog's not allowed to be with your own personal dogs. The dog has to be either on concrete wire or plastic. And it's just a ridiculous environment because here you're supposed to be rehoming the dog and you're teaching it house manners Mm -hmm. before it goes to a new home, but they want you to keep it in the kennel. So it's a really difficult situation. And so, but we can rehome them Mm -hmm. um, as long as we fit within the rules. And, uh, but we are actually building a kennel and I hope to be able to house them for state approval to get uh, rescue 501c3 for that part. Oh, I hope so. We so. can do more of it. That would be wonderful. And I do want to remind our listeners that um, you're Laurel Grinch and it's Dreamcatcher Hill, and your website is laurelspuppies.com. And laurels is spelled L A U R E L S. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. I just want to expand on one thing. I know you had a quote right here mm-hmm. that there's there's beauty in all of around us and in and in us, despite our emotional brain blocking what our senses can pick up in the here and now. So I think that's a beautiful kind of saying for where we're at in this time. And it seems like your situation with all the animals around you, you're allowed to see that beauty. And if you have anything to say to other people that might be listening about how they could kind of tap into their own intuition and beauty and what's around them. Oh, just to, to keep your mind open and appreciate everything, even those small things. It's amazing when you start to appreciate the little things in life, how everything just goes so much smoother and to never give up. Just, just keep plugging along when things seem difficult. Oh, that's amazing, yeah. Laura. Well, thank you so much for being on today. We yeah. learned a lot, that's for sure. Yeah, we did. And thank you for being a true dream catcher for animals and people. Thank you, Laurel. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. <laughs> thank okay. you. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Uh, okay, thank you. Bye bye. Oh, David, I so enjoyed talking to her. She was yeah, just was delightful. Great. What a big hearted woman. Breath of fresh air, that's for sure. Mm hmm. A lot of sunshine. Absolutely. So how do you feel about having a farm now? Oh, <laughs> I don't know that I'm a farm girl, but I would like to have a few acres. I think that would be lovely. Um, Laurel does a lot of work day and night. That's a lot, keeping all those animals going and caring for them. Just a, definitely a full-time job, and you need a lot of help for that. But thank God there are people like her.
Yeah. Right. It's really mm -hmm. beautiful. There's people out there like her yeah. that are really doing all they can for other beings, not even mm -hmm. people, but the animals around them as well. Absolutely. All right, Patty. Well, it's great having you. Let's give it a good enough food. Okay. Thanks, David. Take care. Bye-bye.